Kia ora e whanau. welcome. We are in week three of our Deep End series where we've been exploring how do we have a faith that functions in the deep end. And that deep end really is those seasons of life where situations and storms hit us in a way that we feel like we're just treading water to stay afloat. Maybe it's the loss of a loved one. Maybe it's a financial crisis. Maybe it's the breakdown of a relationship. And it's those things that continue to pile up or hit us out of the blue that lead us to a place of feeling like we are just trying to survive and stay afloat. And the question of this series is how do we navigate that with our faith intact, with our faith actually helping us through that season and knowing that some of us watching tonight may be in that deep end, feeling that pain and that sorrow, while others of us may be in a season of celebration where we're loving life, we're really living our best life at the moment. And you may be thinking, well, why am I tuning in? Why does this series matter to me? And that's because at some point throughout our human existence, we're all going to encounter the deep end. It is going to hit us in some way, shape or form. And so if we can be prepared in advance, it's going to carry us through in a stronger, healthier way than maybe if we didn't have the knowledge and the understanding that this series brings. So a quick recap, the last few weeks we've been unpacking that we have a good God, that at his core, God is good and he is good at his core all the time. It doesn't change. And that we have a God who understands us, that our faith is built on a suffering savior, Jesus Christ, the one who understands our pain and what we've been through. We have a God who knows what you're going through. And that is so comforting to me. I pray it's comforting to you to know that no matter what you're facing, God gets it and that he stands with you In that season, we looked at the story of Shadrach, Meshach and Abednego in Daniel chapter 3, where we see these three men unwilling to compromise on their faith, being thrown into this fiery furnace. And when the king looks in, he not only sees three three men, but a fourth who looks like an angel. And that is the imagery for us that in the flames, in the thick of what we're facing, God's presence and his spirit is with us. There is nothing we face where he isn't already standing with us in the fight. And he is the God who equips, the God that protects, and the God that carries us through what we're facing. The deep end doesn't have to take us out. It may be designed to do that, but the victory and the promise of God is he's going to carry us through what we're facing. And so if you've missed the last few weeks, can I encourage you, go back and watch them. That what we talk to today isn't quite as punchy and weighty without having that full knowledge and foundation to the good God who understands and stands with us in our pain. One of the things we've looked at is that God doesn't cause evil, yet he does purpose it. He's not the creator of that sorrow and that deep end, but he's going to use it for your good. He's going to use it in a way that you can't even imagine what going to come out on the other side of that deep end. And I love Romans 8, 28, that reminds us, we know that God causes all things to work together for good to those who love him and those who are called according to his purpose. This is such an incredible promise, knowing that we have a God who's going to use what we're going through. It's not wasted. That pain is not in vain. There is a purpose to it. God is in the business of using what was destined for evil to actually develop and strengthen you in a way that you couldn't quite imagine. And I love that. It's such a key part of our Christian faith is that God is doing a work in us through the pain, that he is making us more and more like Jesus throughout this process of life. And theologically, it's this big word called sanctification that essentially means that God from the inside out is transforming us to be more and more like Jesus, to be made perfect and complete in him. And he does that through the hard stuff, that through those seasons, he's refining us, he's strengthening us, he is developing in us core characteristics that are like the character of God. And there is something so phenomenal and beautiful that not only do we have a God who saves us in the form of Jesus, not only do we have a God that redeems us from our sin and that separation, but he actually continues to work through us to make us more and more like him. And it's through this act of perseverance that we see that growth, we see that change, that we eventually see maturity and being made more like 
like God. Over this last week, I've read an ebook by John Mark Comer called Loving, Suffering Lovingly. And I wanted to show a few key quotes from what he says. He says that perseverance through trouble has the potential to develop in us a rich blend of emotional maturity and spiritual life to the point where we love where love and joy and peace are the inner life of the Trinity itself become our true nature. Where within our DNA, we become like God himself, where we actually become godly or godlike. When the ancients used the word theos in Greek throughout scripture, what they meant was that the end goal of discipleship is becoming like the God we love. How good the end goal of our discipleship, of our walk with God is to be made like this God that we love, the Savior who suffered for us, to be like him in every regard. The pain you're in is not by vain. God is purposing something in that. He is persevering you into maturity, developing in you that inner spiritual life that is God-like, that makes you more and more like your creator. He continues and says, notice the link between perseverance and maturity. So maturity is what we hope to be. It's what we want to be is presented mature before Jesus. We don't think our way into maturity or even feel our way into maturity. We persevere our way into maturity. Maturity is not the result of reading a lot of books or listening to a lot of podcasts or mastering a repertoire of self-help techniques. Maturity is the result of a long obedience in the same direction. It's the culminative effect of a lifetime of prayer and surrender to God as we persevere through various trials. How beautiful that what you're walking through is producing in you something so good, so desirable that God wants to make us like him that he wants to mature us on that long walk of obedience. And that's really the crux of today's message is that we have a hope eternal, that what God is doing through the deep end is anchored on a hope that he is not finished with us, that the best is yet to come, that it is always too soon to quit because God's in the business of making us like Jesus. And if we don't have clarity of that hope, if we don't have clarity of what lies ahead, we will inevitably lose sight of where we're going and why we're fighting for it. That if we don't have clarity of that goal, it becomes dangerous. It's like not having an anchor in the sea. And that's what I love about Hebrews chapter to 6, 18 to 20, talks about how our hope in Jesus is like an anchor for our soul. It holds us through the thick and the thin, that that anchor is what keeps us going, keeps us in place despite what's being thrown at us. Do you have that anchor today? Do you know that hope that's eternal, that hope that is worth striving and persevering for? Do you know that there's a God who wants to encounter you, refine you, and make you like him, complete in every way. Let me tell you about that hope a little bit more. One of the promises of God is that not only have we had Jesus already uh, living and walking around earth and on the cross, redeeming us, creating a way for us to be restored to God, but the story isn't finished. We have a hope and a promise that Jesus Christ will return. This hope is so radical that in that promise, we learn in revelations that when we're face to face with Jesus, we he returns, that the promise for us is that he'll wipe away every tear from our eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old order of things has passed away. That perfect picture of heaven is that there is no sorrow There is no grief, there is no pain, there is no sadness, there is no crying, there is no death, there is no disaster or tragedy, only the perfect presence of our Saviour, only the presence of our Creator, only you and I made complete in Him. 
I can't think of a better thing to strive for and spend my life for and to carry me through the storm than knowing that one day I'm going to be face to face with Jesus. Does that encourage you? Does that build up hope that is buoyant, that keeps you floating through that season? That's what hope is designed to do, that one day when Jesus returns and all is made complete, that everything we've been through will be worth it, knowing that we're made fully like him, that he did deals with the pain and the brokenness of our world and that there's a joy that's eternal before us that will never fade. I don't know about you, but I want that and I long for that. And and I think about the season we're in across the world right now. It's the Olympic season, right? And so one of the things about the Olympics that I love is that every four or five years, depending on COVID, we dive in and we take stock of our world's best ethics athletes. We see them compete. We see them work so hard to achieve their goals. And their goal is that gold medal. They want that title. They want that position to be the very best in their field. And what we see is the highlight reel. We just get to see the best parts. But what blows my mind is that we don't see all of the sacrifice, all of the hard work, all of the years of training, of early mornings, of giving up time with your family and friends, of not having the treats, of not having that extra beer in order to stay focused on that goal. We just see the end result. We don't see the journey to get there. And the only way that those athletes stick in and continue through the pain and persevere through the pressure is knowing that the goal is so clear in front of them. And their goal that they run for, their goal that they fight for, it is what Paul describes as perishable. It is one of those goals and prizes that will fade away. It's not eternal. It's only temporary. Yet you and I strive for a hope eternal, for a goal that will not fade, for the gold that will not be shaken or unchanged. We have the promise and the victory of the creator of the universe welcoming us into heaven's gates, welcoming us into his presence where everything is made right. Does that not put in perspective the deep end? Does that not put into perspective the season that you're in? God is not finished with you yet. The hope that he has for you is worth persevering. Stay the long and obedient road. Continue in that season and just wait and see what he will do on the other side of what you're facing. That hope is our anchor. That hope is what gets us through. That hope is worth every single fight. And I love this. Romans continues to put it into perspective that I consider our present sufferings are not worth comparing with the glory that will be revealed to us. What you're dealing with now is so small in light of an eternity with God. It may feel like it's the end of the world. It may feel like it's going to take you out, but it is small and temporary in light of what God has for you. And I think that's what we see in the life of Jesus. We see in the life of the three men in the fiery furnace in Daniel 3 as they had that eternal perspective. They knew that what they were facing was not the end, that actually what was laid up for them in heaven was worth the sacrifice, was worth the perseverance that God was doing a work through them and for them. And it's this kindness that he would give us that hope to anchor us through what we're facing. And I love that about God is that the more I walk with him, the more I realize that he has got the answer for every question. He's got the solution to every problem, that every trial is an opportunity for joy. It's an opportunity for him to develop me. And that's next week's message. I won't jump into it too quickly, but joy in the midst of the trial man, that's on offer too. How good that not only do we have a hope that anchors us, but we don't have to grit our teeth through what we're facing. God wants to offer us joy and joy abundant. The best part that I think, more than even this idea of the hope before us, is that that hope is not just for tomorrow. It's not just for the future. It's for now as well, because we have a God who offers a beautiful exchange. Isaiah 61 is one of those life verses for me. One of those chapters I've anchored my life on. And I just want to take you through a little bit of his promise to us. That the spirit of the Lord is upon me in verse 3 
to comfort all who mourn, to grant to those who mourn in Zion, to give them a beautiful headdress instead of ashes, the oil of gladness instead of mourning, the garment of praise instead of a faint spirit, that they may be called oaks of righteousness, the planting of the Lord, that he may be glorified. We have a God who exchanges our ashes for beauty, exchanges our grief for joy, exchanges our sorrow for a spirit of praise. He is in the business of doing that today. He's in the business of doing that through the deep end and he will bring it to complete work at that end goal when we're face to face with Jesus. But I love that he is a God for the now. He wants to encounter you today. If you're in that season and you feel that everything around you is dead ashes, let him show you the beauty he wants to give you. The surrender of our life to him and his spirit at work in us allows us to encounter that truth and that hope that what he is doing is way beyond what we can comprehend. I love that we have a God who's in the business of a beautiful exchange. Maybe that's what you need tonight. Maybe that's what God is wanting to download and reveal is that he is wanting to work now. Not only is he going to get you through, not only is he going to develop you better, but he's going to exchange that ashes for beauty. And one of the ways I think he does that is hindsight. Right, hindsight's always 2020, and I love this idea of allowing hindsight to be our teacher. But one of the things I've noticed is after a deep end season, after the trial, when I look back, I see that God's taken what was most broken, most hurtful in my life, and He's turned it into the most joyous thing, the place where I have most freedom, where I get to tell people about what God has done, where I get to show and encourage that He's at work and reviving the dead things in our lives. Maybe that's your story, that already God has done a miracle, already he's done the work, and you know exactly what it's like to encounter that exchange of ashes for beauty. And I love that he does that and promises that for us today. How good that we have a God who stands with us in all that we're facing, that he wants to carry us through and he wants to exchange our sorrow for his joy, our pain for his goodness. I love Psalm 27. I would have lost heart unless I had believed that I would see the goodness of the Lord in the land of the living. Unless I had that hope, unless I had that promise that things were going to change, that God was going to return, that he was going to make good on his promise to me, then I would have lost hope. And I've been in those seasons where hope has started to fade, where for a moment I've lost sight of that goal, of that clarity, and the anchor has started to shift. Can I encourage you that in one moment of prayer, one moment of encountering the Holy Spirit, that that anchor is firmly secured, that that hope is brought into full view, that we see with clarity that God is still at work, that it is always too soon to quit because you don't know what's on the other side of what you're facing. I wonder where you're at, where you're at tonight. I wonder what God is revealing to you. I love that his promises are perfect, that we can trust them, that they actually hold us through the deep end. You know, if you don't have anything to anchor you, if you don't have anything to keep you afloat, the reality is you get led with the current. You go wherever the wind and the waves push you. But if you can cling to the promise of God, anchored by the hope eternal that he has for us, then you will navigate that deep end. You'll come out the other side mature, the other side more like God, the other side better equipped than what you were, were before you entered in. Can I encourage you that it is worth staying the long course. It is worth that road of following God and obedience and perseverance and trustworthiness. And there's one tip that I want to give you that I think is so important for us to navigate this well. The last few weeks we've talked about how prayer and worship and reading the Bible are those anchors that carry us through, that they're tools that God gives us to encounter him. When we cling to the promises that he's going to exchange our ashes for beauty, our sorrow for joy, that he's going to bring everything into completion, it, it keeps us going. But there is something more that God has given us to carry us through, and that is the community of the church. 
Do not underestimate the power of a community of followers of Jesus alongside you. One of the calls of Jesus is to carry the burdens of our brothers and sisters when they can't. It is one of the ways that we show that God is real to us, that he is powerful and he's active. And you may be in a situation right now where you need someone shoulder to shoulder with you, where you need to experience the love of an invisible God through his visible, tangible people. Do not quit on the truth. Church. I know the church is broken. I know that people are hurt, that the reality of wherever people are, there's pain. But I promise you that where there's people, there's also healing. Where there's people, there's also support. Where there's people, there's a community. And God wants you to stay the course, stay anchored, stay connected to the body of believers that are going to encourage you through this journey. You were not designed to do it alone. God gives you all that you need in the form of His Spirit, in the form of His church. You have what you need in the community of God's people. If you're not connected to a church, if you just tune into Life Switch online and, and follow us this way, that's awesome. But can I encourage you to get connected to your local church? If that's us, we'd love to meet you face to face. But if it's not, get connected. We cannot um, ca- we cannot do anything other than meet in, in real face-to-face encounters to have that community. Online communities are awesome, but it is not the same. It does not equate to being seen and known for who you are. And I think that's the business of God today, is that he's going to get us through that deep end when we're anchored on his truth, anchored on that hope, and supported by his people. It's one of the toughest things to stay the course. But what I have said to me that I cling to is don't quit on a bad day. Don't quit when it's tough. Don't quit when you're hurting, whether that's the church, whether that's a person, whether that's a relationship, whether that's your life. Don't quit on a bad day because you don't know what's on the horizon. You don't know what God is doing. And so may his hope eternal carry you through what you're facing. May he be the perfecter of your faith. May he be the one whose eyes you're fixed on. May it be Jesus who takes you through that deep end. May it be our creator who lovingly suffered for us that gets us through what we're facing. We're going to head to a time of worship and I can only encourage you to dig in and to surrender to God afresh, to meet him in a new way for whatever you need. He wants to give it to you today in prayer and surrender and worship. And if there's any way we can help, then sing out. We'd love to support and maybe meet or talk or pray with you in whatever way possible. But for now, stay tuned as we head into a time of worship. darkness we were waiting without hope without light till from heaven you came running there was mercy in your eyes to fulfill the law and prophets to a virgin came the word from a throne of endless glory to a cradle in the dirt
of heaven held its breath till that stone was moved for good for the lamb had conquered death and the dead rose from the tombs and the angels stood in awe for the souls of all who had come to the father are restored and the church of christ was born then the spirit lit the flame now this gospel truth of old shall not kneel shall not faint by his blood Hey, I hope that that was a powerful time of worship and prayer for you, encountering God afresh, getting that hope for what you're facing today. Let me pray and then join us next week for the final installment, part four of Deep End, where we talk all about the joy that God has for us. Let me pray. Father, we thank you. We praise you. We worship you that you're the God who gives hope. You're the God who encounters us. I pray right now that whoever is watching, wherever they are, that you would come and reveal yourself in a new way, in a fresh way. Lord, that the truth of your promise would hold us through the deep end. Would you protect and guide and continue to bring revelation to us. Lord, set our eyes on Jesus. May we never waver. May we never lose sight of his goodness and his closeness to us. In your mighty name, amen, amen. Have a great week and we'll see you next week for part four.